The Premier League has begun and made an investigation into its most dominant team. One of the world's richest people may be entertaining a bid for the Boston Celtics, and we are looking into how colleges paying their players will affect NIL collectives. It's Tuesday, August 20th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we're going deep on the Premier League and the U.S. men's national team with Roger Bennett of Men and Blazers. We're also checking out a rumor from Bill Simmons that Jeff Bezos is thinking of bidding on the Celtics with our reporter Colin Salau. My colleague Amanda Kristovich explores the NCAA's efforts to control NIL collectives, and we check in on a tennis controversy and the latest on the fight between Jake Paul and Mike Tyson. First, let's hit some headlines. With talks of a deal slowing between Live Golf and the PGA Tour, Live has to find a home to broadcast its events in the coming year. Liv originally signed a two-year deal with the CW in 2023 and, despite underwhelming ratings, is looking to renew a contract with the company for 2025. Liv is also reportedly holding exploratory discussions with Warner Bros. Discovery. Shares of Fubo TV went up over 35% yesterday morning after the company won a preliminary injunction against the launch of Venue Sports. Fubo argued that Venue, a joint venture between Disney, WBD, and Fox Sports, would have monopolized the sports broadcasting business and increased prices for consumers. The injunction has led to serious doubts about Venue and could even kill the streaming company before launch, which you can hear more about in yesterday's episode. UFC reporter and host of the MMA Hour, Ariel Helwani, is reportedly heading to Yahoo Sports after three years with Spotify and Fox. Helwani most notably was once given a lifetime ban from covering UFC by President Dana White for correctly reporting that Brock Lesnar would make a surprise return to the Octagon in UFC 200 in 2016. The lifetime ban was removed just a few weeks later. Becky Hammond denied allegations of mistreating De'Erica Hamby due to her pregnancy. Last week, Hamby filed a lawsuit against the WNBA and the Las Vegas Aces, claiming she was subject to repeated acts of intimidation, discrimination, and retaliation from the Aces, before being traded to the Los Angeles Sparks. Hammond responded by saying, Nobody made a call about trading her until Atlanta called us in January 2023. That's a fact. So, it just didn't happen. I'm sorry. The bullying? I spoke with her every day. If she wanted to practice, she practiced. If she didn't, she didn't. Over-the-top care, actually. Over-the-top care. The Premier League wrapped up its first weekend of action yesterday in a game featuring Leicester City's return from relegation. The weekend also saw Manchester City begin its campaign for a fifth straight Premier League title with a win over Chelsea, and Ed Sheeran's hometown team, It's Witch Town, made their Premier League debut for the first time since 2002. We'll have more on that with Men and Blazers' Roger Bennett later. NIL collectives have been the primary mechanism through which college athletes have been getting paid in recent years. These groups that are affiliated with a particular school but not governed by the NCAA can effectively guarantee athletes big checks, sometimes into the seven figures. Now that we are approaching a settlement that would allow athletes to get paid directly, the NCAA is trying to tamp down the power of collectives as part of the same deal. Our reporter Amanda Kristovich has been investigating this, and she joins us next. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? So you wrote a piece on frontofficesports.com about how the house settlement with the NCAA that is going to create the legal structure in which college athletes can get paid directly by their schools. Um, It it has a a part of that settlement um, that deals with collectives. So what, first of all, what does the settlement say about, what is it proposing on how to handle collectives? Yeah. So it's interesting, right? Because the house settlement really um, is supposed to be about the definition of NIL expanding to broad, you know, including um, broadcast rights and acknowledging that athletes who didn't get to participate before 2021 should get damages. But in this 300 page settlement, um, the NCAA and conferences have negotiated ways that they hope to either stunt the power of collectives or kill them altogether. That that's the goal. So the specifics are that they are saying it is no longer going to be allowed for a collective or a booster to offer an athlete a deal unless it's, quote, the fair market value of a deal. Now, of course, there is a saying in business that the price of something is what someone's willing to pay for it. But let's just take the ends. Let's just, you know, take this with a grain of salt. Right. Um, how are they going to police this? There is going to be a clearinghouse 
for submitting every single NIL deal that is over six, $600 or over. Um, and that entity is going to be able to decide whether or not they believe the deal is quote, a fair market value or whether it's just pay for play, in which case they'll reject it. Um, so the story that I wrote is basically about, you know, this, this detail of the house settlement that, you know, folks have been talking about, but really it's raised a lot of concerns in the NIL slash, you know, athlete advocacy space, because it would basically be giving a third party who we don't know who they would be, um, the power to prohibit NIL deals over $600. Let's get into like why they would want to do this in the first place. My, my sense is that they're trying to say, you get sort of a, not quite a salary cap of 22 million, but you can't just, you know, add on another 50 because you've got donors backing you up and you want to be the, the place that's able to get all the big recruits. Is that your sense of what they're trying to crack down on? Um, yes and no. So the, you're absolutely right that this $22 million number um, is a hundred percent a salary cap. That's definitely how I would describe it. Um, which is another podcast in and of itself to discuss the potential legality of that, which again, my sources are not sure about. Um, but the, the idea of collectives is that they're supposed to be they're They're on top of revenue sharing, right? Like, yes, the NCA is trying to kill the NCA is trying to replace collectives with this $22 million revenue share, right? And not replace collectives you know, in the official sense, but in the unofficial sense, the NCA wants to weaken collectives. The NCA wants to prohibit them from being able to offer, you know, really six figure, seven figure deals to players um, as pay for play. Um, regardless, any deal that a collective offers an athlete is going to be outside of the scope of the house settlement that 22 million is not going to be included in these deals, right? So that you can still think of them as third party endorsements. Like in the NBA, you have your player salary, right? Your revenue share from the team and the league, and then you have your third party endorsements. Um, but unlike in the pros, the NCAA is trying to police these endorsements. And again, that's not something that we've seen anywhere in professional sports. You also have a detail in your story about how like title nine could factor in here somehow and understand that we don't really know how, but are we going to potentially see title nine lawsuits around this house settlement? Yeah. I mean, look, um, in another story I wrote, uh, I believe it was last week. There were, uh, there was an objection filed to the settlement by a group of, um, division one women's sports rowers who, you know, among other issues called out, the um the formulas that the house settlement was proposing for the damages that were going to be awarded and said that it you know was unfair for women's sports athletes that it was undervaluing them um you know that they are going to be earning much less money than they should right um so that's part of it the other part is that um we what we don't know is how title nine will apply to the revenue sharing that 22 million, right? Like how will that have to be dispersed amongst the players? We don't know how title nine is going to factor into that yet. Um, and then question three, right? Is there's this other provision about in the house settlement where collectives would be able to come in house. Now, my sources are saying, and I put this in the story, most collectives don't want to go in house and athletic departments don't want collectives in house. Why? Because A, it's a liability issue, right? They like to tell the collectives, you know, it would be nice if you could offer our players, you know, some deals and, um, and what have you. But they're concerned that collectives would then have to be subject to Title IX in the money that they're offering if they were under the umbrella of an athletic department versus now where most of them, they work closely with their athletic departments, but officially they're not part of the athletic department. Does that make sense? So, I mean, and that's just another way that the NCA is trying to backhandedly 
um, you know, stunt the power of collectives is that the NCA has more power over them if they become part of the athletic departments, right? It's a jurisdiction thing. So we, you know, Title IX would become an issue for collectives for sure. We just don't know how it would affect the deals that they would be offering if they sort of got brought in house. Very interesting stuff. Very complicated. Amanda Christovich, thank you for joining us on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me. NBA insider Shams Charania is leaving stadium with the expiration of his contract, according to the New York Post. Charania was at the Chicago-based media network for six years, but may be clearing his plate in the search of his next big contract. He also has deals with The Athletic and FanDuel, which are reportedly almost up as well. With NBC and Amazon coming in next year as NBA media partners, there could be some well-heeled suitors for one of the league's most prolific newsbreakers. Jeff Bezos is considering a bid for the Boston Celtics, according to Bill Simmons, founder of The Ringer and one of the team's more prominent fans. Speaking on his podcast on Monday, Simmons said there is legitimate buzz about Jeff Bezos buying the Celtics, and I think it's real. I think he's going to be one of the suitors. With a net worth over $195 billion per Forbes, Bezos can outbid anyone. He teased a bid for the Washington Commanders, but ended up passing. The NFL team went to a group led by Josh Harris for $6 billion. With a new media deal set to kick in after this upcoming season, the reigning NBA champs could draw something close to that figure. I spoke to my colleague Colin Sallow on the potential bid, and that conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by front office sports reporter Colin Sallow. Welcome, Colin. Hey, Owen. Nice to be here. Great to have you on. So we got a report from Bill Simmons that... Jeff Bezos is considering a bid for the Boston Celtics. What's your reaction to that report? Yeah, so obviously it's Bill Simmons. And, you know, technically Bill Simmons, as as most of us know, he's not really a reporter, um, but he said it on his podcast that came out on Sunday night that that um, Jeff Bezos is considering, you know, potentially buying the Celtics who weeks after their championship was suddenly put on sale. Um you know, it's 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 interesting that it's coming from Bill Simmons because on the one hand, he's not necessarily a reporter, but you, we all know he's extremely well connected. We all know he is probably the the head of the table for Boston Celtics fans in the media. Um, so he, he you can't doubt that he has some form of connections here. I mean, I think it was like a month ago where he said that, or a couple of months ago where he he already said that. Oh, I think the NBC NBA media rights deal is locked in, and he was right. So he has some credibility, but on the other hand, he's the, the first person saying this. We don't know where it's coming from, uh, but if it is true, we, we know that Bezos has been interested in a sports team before. It was reported that he was interested in the commanders in the NFL, and he didn't ultimately make a bid there. Um, so there is sort of that um, in the background as well. So I think um, someone like Bezos coming in and for a price of what, what Simmons was saying was $6 billion. Um, it would be extremely interesting in how that would affect the whole sports landscape at large. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's there's a few pieces there. And, and Bezos himself was kind of teasing a commander's bid. Obviously, it didn't quite happen. But it, that wasn't just, you know, people making stuff up. You know, he was he was asked about it. And he, he basically said, well, you know, maybe. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, on the Simmons end of it, you know, he's not saying like he's got the term sheet ready to go. He just says uh, there's buzz. And that makes enough sense, especially with Amazon coming in as an NBA media partner. And Obviously, it's hard to know like how connected these things are, but it's there's certainly the obvious line to draw there. Yeah, I think for me, it's really just that, like like you said, all these different things. It shows that Bezos clearly has some form of interest in sports um, with Amazon, with the moves Amazon's making, with you know what he did with the Commanders. If there's some interest in sports, why not go for? And Simon said this as well in the podcast. Why not go for the crown jewel or one of the crown jewels in sports? which is the Celtics, how is that going to change his legacy as well? You know, he's just known as Jeff Bezos, the, the founder of Amazon, um, owning a major sports team, especially one that's primed for success for a while, um, could positively affect him. But as we've seen too, it could negatively affect him um, because of all the media coverage. And if, if uh, the Celtics go down during his tenure, you know, that could be a bad sign. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a, a different place on the food chain to come in from the commanders that would be, you know, any success is, is gravy here, but also you're starting from a pretty low place, whereas right. the Celtics, it's the exact opposite. 
Um, and of course, the NBA is actively talking about expanding. Um, sometime soon, they've got their media deal. Now they can kind of get on to the next big thing, which is you know probably adding two teams. How do you think you know a pretend, you know certainly a record breaking sale and you know maybe reaching six billion on the Celtics could affect the price of entering the league with a brand new team? Yeah, so so Simmons also actually started the entire conversation about Bezos by saying that the NBA is the one that wants the Celtics to be sold by a price of six billion dollars, which would be, of course, the highest of uh, any NBA team has been sold, and would be pretty much in the same price range as as the commander sale of 6.05 billion um and that's a, that's an interesting thing because simmons also noted that a six billion dollar price tag would essentially uh put that as a number or a market price for the expansion fees for what what everyone is saying will be the las vegas team and potentially even the seattle team and simmons even said maybe a mexico city team um, but essentially, that would be the expansion fee price. And just a few you know, months ago, we were thinking it would be $4 billion. Bloomberg reported that it would be $5 billion. So to get another billion dollars and put it at $6 billion would be absolutely huge for the league. And it would be about $400 million to the pockets of each individual owner. Um, I think that's really some another thing that's really being floated out there where this price number will pivot and change the way that the market is. It also makes a lot of sense to start a team in Seattle. And I think the NBA really wants to get back there. Obviously, Amazon is founded there. If, you know, he he does another, like, actually, you know, I, I'm out with the Celtics again. Um, maybe that's his move. And all, of course, the Seahawks could get sold at some point. So he, he could, you know, just start his little empire there if he wants to. Yeah, to your point, like, it's one of the things about owning a team and, and why the Celtics are also an option or could be an option for him is that they don't own the arena. So he could pull a Steve Ballmer and decide, Hey, I'm going to buy this team and then I'm going to build my own arena and I'm going to name it the Amazon dome or, you know, one of his other ventures. Um, he, and he can give that the naming rights. So he could really literally build his empire, um, whether it's in Boston or in Seattle or, or, or whatever other expansion team there is. And anything in particular that you're watching out for as as this whole sales saga starts to unfold? Um, I'm really interested to see if anyone else is going to talk about it, really, because, you know, as much as we want to trust Bill Simmons, I, I think he's he's obviously a credible name in the space. But like I said, he's not really necessarily a reporter anymore. Um, so I, I'm curious if if anyone's going to come out and support this is if someone in uh, Bezos camp is going to say anything about this report. Um, because of course we, like we've talked about here, there's so much smoke, uh, but if it's just one person saying it, it's, it's still, you know, not as credible as if maybe one or two other, are, uh, credible reporters comes out and, and, and finds out. Yeah. And whether or not this was on other people's radars already, Simmons has just put a, you know, a, a big bat signal on this whole situation. So if we don't get more reports on this, that'll be its own signal. Fantastic insights. Colin Sallow, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Of course. Always a pleasure to be here. Michael Ower, the former football player whose story inspired The Blind Side, made public comments this weekend addressing his ongoing lawsuit against the Tuies, the family who took him in and helped him get into Ole Miss, where he eventually was drafted into the NFL. In an interview with The New York Times, Ower said he believes The Blind Side book lowered his draft stock and cost him money because teams thought he was stupid. He also said the movie felt like a comedy about someone else, not a drama about him. Now Ower is suing the Tuies for profiting off his name, image, and likeness. Leanne Tui gave speeches at high-profile events for a decade starting in 2014, charging as much as $50,000 per engagement, according to the Times. Ower's lawyers say that the Tuies have made around $8 million in speaker fees connected to their story of caring for Ower. While tennis is perhaps the most advanced major sport when it comes to integrating technology into getting calls right, with line calls now done almost exclusively by machines, the sport does not use replay. After all, why would you need replay if you'll just get the same machine making the same call? We got an answer to that question on the final point of Jack Draper's victory over Felix auger alassime in the Cincinnati Open. Draper's winning shot bounced off his racket, hit the court right in front of him, and then bounced off his racket again before going over the net. That should be auger alassimes point, but it's very difficult to see with certainty what happened at full speed, and no replay was available to the chair umpire or match supervisor. 
In response, Novak Djokovic called for the introduction of replay in tennis, writing, it's embarrassing that we don't have video replay of these kinds of situations on the court. Everyone who watches TV sees what happened on the replay, yet the players on the court are kept in the dark, not knowing what's the outcome. We have Hawkeye for line calls. We live in the technologically advanced 21st century. Please, respective tours, make sure this nonsense never happens again. Tom Brady was in the booth at the Saints 49ers preseason game, but fans tuning in couldn't hear him. Brady and his broadcast partner, Kevin Burkhart, were using the game as a rehearsal, while Adam Amin and Mark Sanchez provided the actual play-by-play. While Fox could still turn on his mic for the last week of preseason, it seems like they are saving his broadcasting debut for the game's account. Brady is under pressure to perform once people can finally hear him. He's replacing Greg Olson as Fox's top analyst, despite Olson winning the last two sports Emmys for that job. The Premier League kicked off over the weekend, but a lot of the drama is happening off the pitch. Manchester City is facing a potentially massive penalty for violating financial rules. Meanwhile, we have a potential sale of a historic club in Everton. I spoke to Roger Bennett of Men and Blazers about all of that and the new era of the men's national team. I'm joined now by the one and only Roger Bennett, co-founder of the Men and Blazers Media Network. Welcome, Raj. Oh, I mean, it is a joy to be back. So... Premier League has just begun. Um, how many clubs do you think have a real shot at winning the league this year? Good Lord, that is a loaded complication. Yes, the Premier League just started this weekend. 380 games scattered over 281 days. It's like the world's most watched ultra marathon in which we're all just guaranteed to get runner's nipple. And you're asking a very difficult uh, question because Manchester City are uh, on the brink of a five-peat. Uh, I think uh, one statistician said they have an 82.2% chance of winning the league again for the fifth straight time. Manchester City are also uh, facing 115 charges of financial impropriety uh, from the Premier League, uh, whose trophy they've lifted um for four straight years um and that trial is finally uh, about to begin in september uh the uh, implications are that it should be announced sometime december january uh, we've been told um no one knows what the results will be they may be exonerated in which case phenomenal what a humanly remarkable success that would be or they may be found guilty in which case obviously then it's mooted will they get a points deduction Will they get a relegation into essentially the equivalent of AAA or even AA base? Well, this is all uncharted territory. Uncharted territory. No one knows. Um, so we don't know. Manchester City could easily stroll to their fifth straight title. Manchester City could be deducted 70 points and be... Uh, in, in, but, so depending on those two scenarios, those are massive swings. Owen, I don't think you thought we'd delve into this complexity of... Um, essentially, you thought we were going to be talking about sports... Friday night light style. It's actually this season is going to have a dual uh, storyline. It'll be a legal court procedure, a bit like suits, I guess. Um, and so the result of that court case will determine your answer. Uh, ultimately, there could be, if that second scenario is true, uh, seven or eight contenders. And if City are exonerated, probably just one. Do you, do you think the Premier League, obviously it's their own investigation, but are they hoping for one outcome or another? I guess it better to have the scandal, but then a competitive league or um, the scandal. I mean, they're not quite washed away because if they say everything's OK, I'm sure not everyone's going to agree with that. But is it better to have a clean league, at least according to their courts um, or a competitive league or, or are we just entering into uncharted territory? And who knows? But this is uh, genuinely, this is uh, to, to prognosticate on all of this would be utterly foolish. This has never occurred before to this extent at this scale with such a prestige team. Um, look, there's two realities. Um, you can be found guilty of financial misdemeanors, but I, I want to be clear what Manchester city have done on the field. Um, even the battle against complacency, when you've when you've won a, I remember interviewing um, uh, Ovechkin when the Caps had just won the Stanley Cup, and I asked him if he was going to go back to back, and he looked at the camera and he goes back, two back, two back, two back, and of course the Cavaliers have not come close to the Stanley Cup since. Uh, to win once is incredibly hard. Uh, it's like the the British Prime Minister Disraeli once said to climb to the top of a greasy pole. 
Um, to do it back to back is in, in 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 the most cutthroat, most competitive league in the world, immensely difficult. To achieve what Manchester City have done uh, with financial irregularities or not, just from a human perspective, to still listen to your coach, the great genius Pep Guardiola, to not tune him out, to fight the battle um, against complacency. Uh, is remarkable. Uh, but to work out what the Premier League wants, I mean, the Premier League ultimately, the Mecca, the Premier League is the teams. Um, so I'd say the other teams who have competed, let's just use the word fairly, I think they're fairly seething uh, when you speak to them off the record about what's been accomplished. So the question, what does the Premier League want, is a deeply complicated one. This is utterly unprecedented. Um, and again, we can only watch on the field with Marvel at the soap opera, uh, this telenovela that is the Premier League on it, and this off the field. It, it's like the emotional and the rational. None of us watch football for court procedurals. None of us watch sports um, to see a litigation go down. Um, you know, to watch the Manchester City fans, they have lawyered up. They've, they've hired the most expensive lawyer in Britain Lord Panix is his name. Um, the fact that we know his name is like the ridiculousity of this uh, whole situation. The Manchester fans sing a Smith song or held a banner out, Panix on the streets of London. Um, the fact that this is now what we've been reduced to, almost watching football with a split screen, I th- I'd say there's probably no winners in this situation, Owen. I mean- Manchester City is obviously the big high profile case here, but uh, it's not like everyone else is, you know, purely clean. And if we could see everyone's books and know everything going on, that everyone, everyone's 100% above board except for them. And uh, we also have the case of Everton, which I want to get to in a moment. But, <laughs> but you have an interesting face on your expression on your face. I'm, I'm wondering what's behind it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm from Liverpool. I actually am an Everton fan. And Everton are the team who just perpetually get docked uh, points for financial irregularities. They're like a footballing millhouse from the Simpsons. Uh, and somehow I think the Manchester City uh, situation is going to get cleaned up where City will be found guilty and Everton will be docked 20 points for Manchester City's misdemeanors. But go on, what were you going to say, Owen? Uh, well, I, mean, I actually just wanted to get into the, the Everton news. The team is in another exclusive negotiating window, this time with John Texter would have to sell his shares of Crystal Palace to uh, to take over with Everton. Um, you, how, how are you how are you feeling as an Everton fan about at least the possibility of Texter taking over? God, I love it. John Texter, if you listen to front office sports, do it, baby. Don't look at the books. That's what I'd say. John, don't look at the books. What are books? They're just numbers. Uh, leave with your heart. Uh, due diligence um, is not really necessary. You just look at the fans, listen to them singing, jump on in, come and take over Everton Football Club. Everton are just the grand old dom of, of English football. At this stage, probably the biggest team not to have um, you know, well-funded, well-heeled owners. Um, there's a reason for that. We did have, uh, but it was a Russian oligarch uh, um, who took over the team. Uzmanov, who left Arsenal where he had a minority ownership, started to fund Everton to the hilt uh, through his oil partner, a man called Mashiri, uh, who was really the front for Usmanov. Usmanov, if the name's vaguely familiar, it'll be because when uh, Ukraine was invaded, the one oligarch that every country felt quite safe putting on their economic blacklist and confiscating all funds was Usmanov. Um, Everton lost an enormous amount of their revenue almost overnight. Um, I think it was like 40% of their revenue. The, 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 the training ground was sponsored by a Newsmanov holding company. The, the, the shirts were sponsored by... An, we lost so much um, and went into a heavy debt spiral. Um, and then just in football, um, when darkness on the edge of town scenarios occur, just buzzards dive on in. Um, and the challenge for Everton Football Club, a number of quite reputable... Uh, sports investors have looked at the books. Uh, f- the Friedkin family, who own Roma, uh, was the last one who really took the book super seriously. Um, and there are said to be uh, loans that are on Everton's books from another um, American. I don't know how you describe them. Um, 777 Sports. They're partly interested in sports ownership. They're partly 
I mean, they seem to only want to be involved in sports ownership so they can have litigation in as many courts around the world as possible for truly dodgy dealings. And they brought loans uh, onto Everton's books that apparently can be called in uh, by multiple uh, parties who've loaned the money to 777 in the first place. And when you have that, when it's not clear to the buyer who can actually call in the loan, you're essentially inviting a court, you're, you're buying into court cases um, that you do not want to be buying into. Uh, the books are slightly toxic. So what would I say to Texter? I'd say, don't look at the books, baby. Just enjoy. Just look at the history, the authenticity, uh, the wonder, the possibility, and do the right thing and buy Everton Football Club. Mauricio Pochettino was um, was coaching, Chel- coaching Chelsea last year. The reporting is all that he has agreed to take the U.S. men's national team job. It is not yet official. There's still some, apparently some... Um, negotiations around a severance package with Chelsea. Anyway, assuming this does happen, what, what does this move mean for the U.S. program? So uh, it's incredible. Uh, it's just a remarkable moment for everyone who loves the sport uh, in the United States. Um, U.S. soccer. A year ago, uh, the women's team um, were bounced out of the World Cup um, at the earliest stage in their nation's history. Uh, it felt like a, just a true, just a, a Tracy Chapman fast cut uh, of a reality in which the rest of the world hadn't just caught up, but had surpassed the uh, uh, the long uh, given advantage of the United States women, which was Title IX. Um, in came the best coach in the world, Emma Hayes, this North London uh, ball of wonder a winner. She talks about herself. English people do not talk about themselves often as winners. She's got all of the confidence, all of the wonder. Also won at Chelsea Football Club. Um, But her biography uh, began in America where she came over when English women's football was a backwater and it was really flying uh, here. She came over and she talks about herself as born in England, but made in America. And Emma came over and delivered one of the greatest footballing transformations I've seen in the modern period. I think it was about 72 days from the time she first trained the team to the time they won gold at the Olympics. They're back to number one and everything. It feels like a storm had engulfed the program and then suddenly it went away. The sun's back out. It's great sailing and it feels so bloody good. Um, And now US soccer, um, after a terrible Copa America, the tournament that was held here over the summer, in which we suffered the humiliation of hosting the tournament and failing to um, emerge from the group stage, some really humiliating losses. Um, U.S. soccer have embarked on a search for a manager who can lead this team into World Cup 2026, again on home turf. Um, And by all reports and by everybody I've spoken to on the English side uh, of the operation, uh, Mauricio Pochettino, this incredible a uh, bundle of joy, an Argentinian man of wonder. Um, I adore him. Who is he? He's just a good human being at his heart. Uh, he's a team builder, a culture builder, um, a, a man who develops young players, who believes in them um, and builds just an effervescent, joyous uh, collective mission that everybody can buy into. Um, he coached at Tottenham Hotspur, took that team who were like a, a mid-level team. He took them to the Champions League final, um, he took them in. He made them a collective fist of young joy, um, and he, then he, you know, had his bumps. He went to Paris Saint Germain, won the league there. But you could win the league there, Owen, as manager. Um, kind of got, kind of got outrun um, by the politics there. But like Ned Stark in King's Landing, and then reemerged at Chelsea. Um, really, a program in great chaos, a transformation under their American owners. God bless got them to sixth place last season, got them back into Europe. He got them forward momentum, uh, but, you know, it made it very clear he was having none of the fun he needed to stick around. Uh, and now U.S. soccer have undertaken a search. They said they were going to get a world-class caliber manager. They use the word a serial winner. Um, he's not a serial winner, but he is most certainly the most accomplished club coach that U.S. soccer have ever engage he's a natural spanish uh, speaker so to engage the spanish language audience in america that's an enormous um an enormous thing of wonder um he's never managed the international program before which is different to the club program for reasons i won't bore you with uh on this podcast um so there's nothing that's a slam dunk as a manager there never is it's a bit like a donor organ you don't know if it's gonna 
uh, get rejected by the host body uh, until it comes in. But what it is, is US soccer, what they've done on the women's side, they have done the equal uh, on the men's side. And it just feels so bloody good to feel joyous uh, about the possibility to be candid in this moment. It's magnificent. Yeah, I remember last time we spoke, it was shortly, but it was you know, heading into the group stage at Copa. And we were talking about how, you know, of course, they're going to get out of the group stage, but what would really make a mark as if they, you know, could win a round or two, you know, oh, show themselves to be competitive, you know, they could potentially beat a Brazil or an Argentina. And <laughs> obviously, that, that, that possibility didn't even, um, we didn't even get to see. And, you know, in retrospect, maybe that's, a good thing in the long term, because had they won a round or two at Copa, then Burhalter probably sticks around. They say, you know, like, okay, if, if it's not broke, let's let's keep going. You know, this team's got potential. They're young. You know, it's, let's let's keep our guy. Um, and now we have a new era with Pochettino. There is so much uh, potential on this US team. There is a remarkable um, cast of characters. Um, we have a show on the Men and Blazers media network uh, with Tyler Adams, who's the captain of the U.S. men's national team. And uh, he came on and talked about what does the U.S. really need right now? And he said, we need a we need a coach who will come in and just tell us, uh, not ask us, but tell us what's going to go down. Um, he didn't say a man we're afraid of, but it's someone up there in that caliber. They need a coach where when he says, do it. You don't ask yourself, should we be doing this? But you, you're looking at me like this gent knows uh, we will follow him wherever he goes. Pochettino is that. He will make these players suffer. Uh, I interviewed a footballer who did preseason with Poch once, um, and he said um, it was as if you had to have um, – he treated us like dogs. It was as if you needed three lungs. Um, so he does try and uh, demand a lot from his players to walk through fire, to know that ultimately to win um, is to suffer. Um, this deal is not done yet. The contract is still being negotiated. Uh, there are, as you said, in your leading um, complications in terms of his exit uh, from Chelsea and the financial implications of that um, to be worked out. But the fact that Pochettino wants this job uh, which, by the way, is an incredible job to coach and be the face of this U.S. team when there's a World Cup um, in the United States. Some of your listeners will remember uh, it was before my time, but when Pele was the face of football um, in the 1970s in the NASL, um, Pele built a commercial reality off being the face of the league in that team. To be the manager of this team at the similar time, uh, you said it in your last question, it, if they make noise at this World Cup, uh, the commercial possibilities uh, for the next manager um, of this US team could be astronomical for life. Um, so Godspeed. Um, again, Todd Burley of Chelsea Football Club. I know you watch front office sports. Um, so please just sort it out, Poch. Get that contract done. Because um, the World Cup is just 661 days away from kicking off. Who's counting uh, on our shores? That's a blink of an eye in terms of culture building. And we need every moment we can uh, to move this program to where we all hope and dream and yearn for it to be. All right. We'll leave it there. Roger Bennett, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Big, big love. And John Texter, hello. And thank you. And please. Uh, and Todd, come on. Go, go, go. USA. Courage. How much would someone need to pay you to get punched by Mike Tyson? Jake Paul claims he is making $40 million for his fight with Iron Mike. The YouTuber turned fighter said, I'm here to make $40 million and knock out a legend at Fanatics Fest on Sunday. The fight has drawn concerns for Tyson's safety. The former heavyweight champ is 58, 31 years older than Paul, and had to postpone the fight due to an ulcer flare-up. He now says he's ready to go for the November 15th bout, which will consist of eight two-minute rounds and use 14-ounce gloves as opposed to the standard 10 ounces. Bengals star receiver Jamar Chase is holding out for a huge raise, and another team legend is confident that a deal will happen before the start of the regular season. Chad Johnson, aka Ocho Cinco, told ESPN reporter Adam Schefter that a deal is going to get done in the coming days. As for how he knows, Ocho Cinco left it ambiguous if this is based on inside information or just intuition, saying, I just know. Chase is in the last year of his rookie deal and slated to make $4.9 million. He's reportedly looking for something more along the lines of his college teammate, Justin Jefferson, whose new deal pays him $35 million annually for four years. 
Before we go, here's a clip from a fake fan disaster. The Chargers thought it would be fun to have a fan propose to his girlfriend during the Kiss Cam segment of their preseason game against the Rams. She appeared to reject the proposal before a different fan spilled her nachos all over the guy as he was down on one knee. Thank you. Thankfully for that guy, the whole thing was staged, and hey, we're finding new territory when it comes to in-game entertainment. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, share this episode with a friend you think would be interested. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.